I just love Sabbath. Don't you? <laughs> All the things that go on during the week, especially uh, in these last days, uh, whether it doesn't matter, you know, the Lord tells us to watch and pray. So, you know, you take a look at what's going on in politics. You take a look at what's affecting you in your own life and all these different stressors and worries and all those things. And one day a week, we can leave those things at the door Amen. and just come before the Lord and ask for His, His wisdom, His blessing, and His love in a special way. Uh, on this day. It's, it's an amazing thing, and I know Paul has said it. I believe Bill has said it also. I, I don't understand now, um, as an individual who has been doing this for actually a pretty short time, about three years now, I don't understand how people do it without a Sabbath, how people can get through life without having this, this time to, to come and renew once a week. Today, we are going to continue our discussion. We're looking at some of the other prophets and Mrs. White and seeing how they compare with the tests that are in Scripture. There are still a few more tests. We're going to start getting into the physical tests. One of the thing, the last thing where we left off was in Deuteronomy, which talked about if the thing that a prophet says, if it doesn't come to pass, you do not need to worry about them. Do not be afraid of them. In other words, their predictions must come true. And we've seen that so far, Ellen White's have come true. So before we uh, go any further, let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to come in to our presence and guide us. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we we come before your mighty throne asking uh, for your presence here, asking for your blessing, Lord, asking for your guidance, your wisdom. Thank you, Lord, for your scriptures, that inspiration penned throughout all the ages, Lord, that the Holy Ghost have inspired holy men and women to write different things under the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for those counsels because we know that they are our only safeguard, our only, our only refuge, our only trust, in that they are in you because you are the word. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for that discernment. We ask that you abide with us here now as we continue this study and that your ministering spirits would be in here with us to open up our minds and to help us to, to see the differences between the prophets of the past, the prophets of the modern era, and the different tests that we can apply. In Jesus' holy name, amen. So we talked about the major trade unions and monopolies, which she spoke about, that would come to pass in I honestly, when I think about some of this stuff, I, I, I don't even think Mrs. White really even understood how big some of these uh, predictions or how fulfilled some of these predictions would be. Some of the evils that she speaks of that are coming in the world. You think back in the 1800s, those are the good old days, right, to us, right? Those are the, those are the days when everybody was good, right, in our minds. But we, there was evils going on then, and we see that slippery slope from the time of when the revolution took place and, and, and God stepped in and intervened upon behalf of the American people. And you've seen throughout time, as you look at history, how far we've traveled away from God and how lewd, how violent, how debaucherous, licentiousness, and every, every manner of evil is not only done in the world today, but is essentially promoted. When we see what men can do to each other in some of the wars that she predicted that would come, the great wars that she predicted, did she, 
understand what really would have happened, though. If she, I wonder if she really understood fully what World War I or World War II would actually look like. It's amazing. Anyway, so we, when a prophet makes a prediction, it has to come to pass. So we have another prophet, so-called. Who is this? Joseph Smith, right. The prophet, the leader, the savior, whatever, of the Mormon religion. He spoke this. He said, Yea, the word of the Lord concerning his church established in the days of the restoration of his people as he has spoken by the mouth of his prophets and for the gathering of his saints to stand upon Mount Zion, which shall be the city of New Jerusalem, which city, city shall be built beginning at the temple lot, which is appointed by the finger of God, in the western boundaries of the state of Missouri. You hear that? The new temple, which will be the beginning of the new Jerusalem and the new Mount Zion, it's going to be built by the Mormon people in the state of Missouri. That's what he's saying. And dedicated by the hand of Joseph Smith. So this was supposed to be built in his lifetime. Did that happen? No, there was no new temple, there was no new Jerusalem built in Missouri, and it was definitely not dedicated by Joseph Smith. He's dead now. So this is impossible to be fulfilled, but we go on. Others with whom the Lord was well pleased, therefore, as I said concerning the sons of Moses, for the sons of Moses and also the sons of Aaron shall offer an acceptable offering and sacrifice in the house of the Lord, which house shall be built unto the Lord in this generation in the 1800s upon the consecrated spot as I have appointed. Doctrines and Covenants, 84, 2 to 3, and verse 31. They style it biblically, their writings. So did this happen? No. So is he a true or false prophet then? False. We have other tests that we could even apply to this. This is a man who wrote an entirely new testament. Is that in line with uh, the law and the testimony? No. Some of the things he wrote were pretty racist also. He essentially stated that if you were black, that you were, you were a cursed tribe that God had cursed of the sons of uh, Israel and that it was some curse that was supposed to be on the people forever. Blackness attached to the skin. That's what he, that's what he believed. That's what he taught. And... The, of course, the sexual sins are always there. This man had upward of 15 wives. Is that in line with Scripture? No. No, it's not. So let's move on. What about some of her health predictions? And some people say, you know, Mrs. White, she plagiarized her health predictions. Well, I have a question. Of all the different things they were teaching in her day, how did she know which ones to plagiarize and which ones to leave alone? Hmm? She said in 1864 that tobacco is a poison. In Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4A, page 128. This was, and this is, I mean, duh, right? Tobacco's a poison. Okay. Good job. But she said this in the 1860s. She said this at a time when doctors were prescribing smoking to tuberculosis patients. All the way up, there's still commercials that exist today that you can look up on YouTube. Old commercials from the 1950s that says, four out of five doctors recommend camels. For, for the, <laughs> let's look at this one. Give your throat a vacation. Smoke a fresh cigarette. You know, that's funny to us, right? Because that's ridiculous. You're, just, you're literally destroying your throat, giving yourself cancer by doing that. Viceroy's filter the smoke. As your dentist, I would recommend Viceroy's. What, is, what do cigarettes do to the teeth? So, almost 100 years later, in 1957, the American Cancer Society concluded that smoking was a major factor in lung cancer. I have that missing right there, sorry. Lung cancer. Paul? Fatima Cigarettes, which was the parent company for Camel, 
I actually had a commercial on Dragnet in the 40s. You can go on, like you said, YouTube and hear these commercials that they had studies that doctors say that Fatima cigarettes do not affect your throat at all. And they're a quality cigarette. Yet why are these people not being held sued, the AMA? Why are they not being held responsible? And Hollywood, why? That's the question I want answered. Yes, because if we went around and did something like this, we would be sued, right? Many of us would go to jail, probably for the rest of our lives. But it's okay when these major multi-million dollar companies do it. That's fine. Paul? Well, one other thing, and I'll leave you alone. The, <laughs> I like people who say they boycott tobacco companies or they're foul or we're not. Well, they don't make much money in this country. They make about five cents a pack on cigarettes. In Europe, they make about two dollars a pack. But you cannot buy a food product process that the money does not go back to a tobacco company. Mm. They are powerful entities. And that stuff that happened in the 90s with Clinton was a joke. It was a big tax write-off for them. That's all it is. They already had that prearranged. So you think they're interested in your health? You better think again. So Mrs. White was speaking about these things hundred years before Western civilization as we know it caught on. And again, one of the things that gets mentioned is, well, she plagiarized that because there are other writers at that time, that, that doctors, that said, no, tobacco is bad for you. Well, let me ask you a question. Is God's truth solely in his prophet alone and no one can find out any truth on their own by doing research. No, that's not true. So you have doctors who, who God probably is guiding, and they're searching for answers in health, and they're doing their own experiments, and they found, guess what? Smoking's bad for you. It's not good for you like all the other doctors are saying. And Mrs. White, receiving messages directly from the Lord, repeats the same thing. You see, God, God doesn't say, no, you have to go to my prophet in order to find any kernel of truth at all. No, we can find these things through our own research, especially these, were the, they're of the sciences. Another one, 1863. There are those who ought to be awake to the danger of meat eating who are still eating the flesh of animals, thus endangering the physical, mental, and spiritual health. She said that, uh, review in her own May 27th, 1902, but the, her, her health, her, uh, her great vision of health started in 1863. The World Health Organization finally, over almost 150 years later, folks, <laughs> finally classifies meat as a carcinogen in 2014, but they don't say whether or not it affects you mentally or spiritually. So they're still, in my opinion, they're still not fully caught up. But what have they been, what do they tell, when you tell someone you're a vegetarian, what are they, what's one of the first things they usually say to you? Where do you get your protein from? You're gonna die. You're gonna become anemic. How many people are in the emergency room right now who are anemic? Not many. How many vegetarian and vegans are there? Many. If this was a serious problem, you know, my question, what I always turn around and say, I say, okay, where does the cow get the protein from? Right? It's in, protein's in everything. Why, why get a secondhand protein when you can cut out the middleman and all the toxins that are in that blood and go straight to the source and get the protein yourself. It is. Everything's about money, isn't it? It's sad, but these are the same companies, you know, all these companies that come out with these, these findings that, oh, you guess what, if you, if you drink uh, six glasses of wine a week, you'll extend your life by, you know, two, three years or, or Eating burgers is, is good as long as you eat the, uh, the turkey lean. Yeah, well, that's a better option. But 
you're still eating the meat. And you know what? All these, all these different studies, the things that I've found, is if you look who's funding those studies, it's the meat and dairy companies. Almost every time, without exception, almost every time. It's amazing. So, Mrs. White, once again, 150 years before the World Health Organization, before the World Health Organization was even a thought, she already had classified meat. And she gave us more information. Do you think they're saying it's a carcinogen, it's bad for the physical? We can accept these by faith, but there is also science to back this up nowadays, too. But the food you eat doesn't just fuel your physical body. The food you eat fuels your mind. Your mind has to think. It has to run on something. If it's running on Fritos and cheeseburgers and McDonald's, you're going to have a McDonald's mind. Does that make sense? I mean, why don't we put two and two together? If, you, if, you eat, if you're eating Burger King every day, you're going to have a Burger King brain. That's what you're going to have. But if you eat vegetables and fruits from the vine, fresh, organic, if you can, if you can, uh, breads that you, you make yourself or that you know to be free from from all these different preservatives they put in there and staying away from the meat, staying away from the, the alcohol, staying away from cigarette smoking and things like that. Your health, your mind will improve. Jesse? Speaking of the mind, uh, I can't remember where I read it, but it talked about once that when we go in board meetings sometime, a lot of the uh, mm. disagreements that we have it's because of what we have eaten. It affects our thought processes. So sometimes we can't rationally come together, come to a conclusion. That's, that's, that's such a scary thought, isn't it, Jesse? That we, we could have strife and arguments between each other. Essentially, Jesse, I mean, to, to put it in layman's terms, because we're too stupid to really figure out what we're trying to say or, or think it through because of the food we're eating. I don't want the food that I'm eating. How dumb of a thing. I don't want the food that I'm eating to keep me out of heaven. Mm. Come on. Paul? You know, I find it interesting. You talk about the WHO and, and uh, this, the AMA, and the Dairy on Meat and Council, et cetera, et cetera. You want to see a big contributor to these organizations in, if nothing else, in speeches and popularity, Bill Clinton. What is he now? And why? Vegan. He's a vegetarian because his heart was blown apart. And that was the man that used to brag and boast about jogging over to McDonald's in the morning and getting breakfast there and Big Macs. What is he now mm. and why? So, but people don't want to hear this. <clears throat> they don't want to hear this. And Mrs. White says, blood produces thought food produces blood. So what you eat is what you become. Absolutely. And another thing, why are there so many strains of fruits and vegetables, which as Adventists we like to ignore, are pollutant resistant, but no bio animal is. Why? That it doesn't matter what toxins they put on them, it's filtered out. Adventists don't want to believe that, but there's a big list of them, and you don't have to worry whether they're organic or not, because God saw this and he put it in there but they will filter out all the toxins interesting Madeline has something to add Hilda one of the notions is that oh it's too expensive to be <laughs> on a plant-based diet oh it's too expensive to be vegan or vegetarian mm. this week I spoke with my sister Who's, having, who's facing some health challenges because of her diet. And one of the first things that I said was, have you ever thought about stop, you know, mm. removing some of the things that you have in your diet? She says, well, you don't understand because it's very expensive. It's easier for you to say. But, you know, it's not. It's, you know, 
Council is asking us to use a simple, very simple diet. Yes. You know, just removing the meat. You know, I think that's an excuse. It's very expensive. Because I used to think that way. When I, I was, my last problem was fish. Um, and I was, man, it's expensive. But it's not really expensive. Are vegetables, how expensive are they? If, okay, you can't get um, organic, but you can get farm, um, locally grown mm -hmm. vegetables and stuff like that. But it can be done. And people just don't want to do it. That's, that's the problem. They don't want to leave that flesh first. The other day I was at Publix. I, I needed lunch, so I went to their whatever, deli. I got some rice, black beans, and some corn. And there was a gentleman standing next to me. No meat? He says, no, I'm a vegetarian. And he looked me up and down. <laughs> You're supposed to be sickly, right? I'm supposed to be supposed sickly. to be a skeleton. I'm supposed to be sickly and skeleton <laughs> because he's a, he has a lot of vegetarians on his job, and they're so sickly and skinny. I says because they're eating the wrong stuff. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And you know, when you when you think about it, Samuel and Madeline, how much does it cost for a thing of a ground beef? Like fifteen, twenty dollars usually. I don't even know how much it costs. That's a lot. People don't want to spend that much for vegetables, and they don't have to because they don't cost that much. So you actually end up, and think about this, how much of the food that you buy, if you, if you bought $100 worth of vegetables, and you bought $100 worth of meat, how much, what percentage of that food is good for you? So what are you buying? That's a way to think about it, isn't it? And another thing I, used, I like to think about or bring, bring up to people is when they start having health problems, how much is your copay? How much does it cost for you to, to get your pharmaceuticals every month so that you can continue to have your Big Macs or whatever it is? It's a lot cheaper, a lot cheaper to just eat simple foods. No, this is not nourishing meat. That's an oxymoron. Paul? You know, I ate both ways, and I don't care what anybody says. I spent a lot more money when I ate meat, mm. mm -hmm. a lot more. And I'll tell you one spot that they always eliminate, restaurants. Go get a prime rib dinner, a lobster dinner. That's your grocery bill for a week. Mm. That's true. I'm not exaggerating. Oh, and a special occasion. All these garbage confectionaries and everything. How much does a, do they spend on birthday cakes and ice cream? How many groceries, how many carrots and peas and potatoes can you buy? And the most perfect food in the world is rice and beans. How much is a bowl of that? Every need you have is right there. So I, I don't accept that. I won't listen to it. I ate both ways. It's a lot cheaper to eat this way. Oh, yes. All the way around. I think it comes full circle. It, it's, it's what Samuel said. It's that they just they want to keep eating the way they want to eat. And I hear the same thing. Oh, you're a vegetarian? Yeah. And I, I understand that because I was a big time meat eater myself. I used to cook ribs and I was known for making a good rack of ribs. I mean, I used to tell my wife that I would never, I mean, I looked at her with, with, <laughs> with my Clint Eastwood face and I told her that I would never be vegetarian ever. <laughs> but the Lord kept bringing this problem around. You know, and, and, and it's a process. It's a process. You know, if, if somebody's watching right now and they're like, wow, I just, I, I can't j make the jump. I'm still eating unclean meats and stuff. Well, do, do it progressively. Do one thing at a time. First, I stopped eating pork. I said, okay, Lord, I'll do that. And then me and my wife tried to be vegetarian. And we lasted about six days. And after that, we failed and we got some fried chicken. <laughs> and... I remember telling her, I said, we'll try again in 10 years. That's what I told her. Really? Yeah. <laughs> but the Lord brought it back around, and it wasn't 10 years. Uh, yeah. and, and when the difference was this, the second time I did it, well, we both did it, we placed our trust in God, and we said, we can't do this, but we know you can. So these, these messages... These proofs of Ellen White's commission as a prophetess. 
the things that, that our response should be, we don't have to do it alone. Amen. He's going to do it. He's going to walk every step with us. And he knows how hard. He knew I loved ribs. He knew that. But he said, no, you have to give this up because I care too much about you and your mind. I need you thinking clearly. And I have. Every, every person I've talked to that has given up meat it talks about the cloud that has been removed from their mind. They're more focused. They retain information. They have a better memory. They, they can, they're more aware when they're driving and when they're doing other things. Their brain just, it's, it's working better. Because like Paul said, this meat, every, every creature on earth takes in toxins every day. And if you're eating another creature, you're not only processing your own toxins, but you're, you're eating their toxins and now have to process their toxins as well. What kind of blood are you going to make? Impure blood. Impure food, impure blood. Paul, and then Sam. Another issue, too, you have mental and spiritual uh, along with eating meat goes brutality. Uh -huh. I was an avid fisherman, and the way that fish are treated, these are God's creations. Filleting them and throwing their live bodies back in the ocean. Uh, hunting. You know, you wound an animal, you don't shoot them because you're going to ruin the meat. You use your knife and slit their throat. It creates brutality. On the farm, we used to have a saying, you don't pet your food and you don't eat your pets. In other words, you've got to make a mental distinction between killing an animal and loving an animal. Well, i got news for you. You become brutalized. Mm. And that animals today, pigs, chickens, cats, they're not even considered animals. They're considered food stock. Mm -hmm. What does that do to the spirituality and the mentality of a person as far as a living creature goes. That's interesting. Yes, absolutely. And to Adventists, there's no such thing as clean meat. I don't care whether it's a pig or a cow, if it is not raised, slaughtered, and prepared exactly the way the Bible says. If you're eating beef and you think it's clean and it's still got blood in it, and you don't know where it came from, you don't know how it was slaughtered, it's unclean meat as far as God is concerned. Same thing with the fish. Right. So the there's a biblical process. And when you make it the way the Bible says, it ain't very tasty. No. Samuel. You know, I remember when I was growing up, you know, I came into the faith 13 years old, I was. And they never taught health reform because mm. we always ate our meat. <laughs> wow. We always ate meat, you know. But I left the faith in my 20s, and the Holy Spirit was working real hard to bring me back, and it happened. So when I was in the church again, I started to be convicted. So I, I did what you did. I gave up this. I, I never ate pork. Never, never, never ate pork. I gave up chicken. I gave up turkey. I gave up fish. No, I didn't give up fish. That was the last thing. But I was still eating, I call eggs, liquid chicken. Mm. And I was struggling with that because, you know, working in corrections, you know, you stop over at the, at the restaurant in the morning, you get yourself an egg. I, I used to love egg and cheese. Yeah. And yeah. you stop off and eat that. So I was praying, Lord, you have to give me victory over this. So I got over that. And then it was the fish. Now, it was the fish that was the issue. But you know what? We have to be obedient. Yes, absolutely. You know, and you read these things in Sister White's writings, and then you read the Bible. In the last day, all flesh shall be diseased. Do we believe that or don't we? Yeah. God said it's going to be, this. are we in the last days? Yes. So finally I, I, I did it cold turkey. I said, I'm just doing it. That's what God wants me to do. And I did it. Did I miss it? Not really. Maybe at the beginning. Right. But I'm over it. You're, yeah, your palate changes. Totally and, changes. And that's, that's one of the things of hope we can have for uh, individuals watching who are maybe thinking we're a little weird right now. Um, <laughs> Your palate will change over time, and you'll begin to, you'll begin to, you won't, you know what I see when I see a steak or something? I just, I see a carcass. That's what I see. It's not appetizing to me anymore. 
It's not appetizing. Samuel, you got, hold on, hold on. One more thing. I had an, another thing. I, I had an inmate that used to work for the Bronx. Is it the meat market in the Bronx? He used to tell me that when they cut up the cows and they found cancer in the meat, they would take that meat and grind it up and give it to you as ground meat. Fantastic. It's like, and Mrs. White has a comment about that on councils on diet and foods. If, if even if individ, meat eaters knew what actually happens to the meat that they eat, they would turn in horror from it. So, we know these practices uh, of these meat industries and are, are subpar. You know, if you're not, not to mention just one last thing on this, and, the, and then we'll move on. You know, it, what happens to you when you're, when you're very fearful and scared? You, you get an adrenaline cocktail released into your body. And cortisol gets released into your mind. And all that travels throughout your entire body and your blood. And your whole body is essentially infected. So if you're eating an animal that was scared to death right before it died, you're taking in that toxic chemical cocktail that they released into their own bloodstream because they were, it was fight or flight for them, but they couldn't go anywhere. So those are all the things. There's so many more reasons that we could give, uh, but we got to move on. So again, 150 years later, we are now seeing this. People now know this as a standard fact that meat, it's not really that good for you. Finally. They're still going to make believers out of a lot of people, but the vegan uh, and, and vegetarian movements have grown exponentially. The documentaries are there, too. The stones are crying out. This one is one that steps on a lot of people's toes. Mm. Coffee and tea. In 1905, Mrs. White stated, tea and coffee do not nourish the system. That's odd, because I remember when I was in the military, I learned that coffee was good for you. So I tried to drink more of it. Their effect is produced before there has been time for digestion and assimilation. In other words, if you eat food and you have food in your stomach, caffeine, tea and coffee, she didn't call it caffeine, but tea and coffee, that's what she's referring to, it will, it will force that food through your body without you picking up almost any of the nutrients from it. Is that good for you? No. no. <clears throat> the effect is produced before there has been time for digestion and assimilation. Essentially, it gives you false energy. And what seems to be strength is only nervous excitement. Ministry of Healing, page 230, or page uh, 326. We're still messing with this one, but in 1960s, somebody was honest, 1967, illness otherwise unexplained may be caused by excessive ingestion of xanthine cocoa alkaloids, including those in coffee, tea, cocoa, and those in some popular beverages. H.A. Ryman, Journal of the American Medical Associator. But we still today have things like this. Ten proven health benefits of coffee. Introducing the first coffee that helps you sleep better. You hear that, guys? You're, you're really tired. You can't fall asleep. You, f you feel like you, you can't get to bed. Have a cup of this coffee, and you'll fall. Come on. Seriously? But this is, this is the problem, though. People have itchy ears. And they want, these, they want these things to be true so bad because this is their drug, isn't it? Sam? I used to drink by myself, two pots of coffee a day. Oh, wow. When I got off it, I had withdrawals, headaches. Hey, keep the mic. Headaches, <laughs> withdrawals. I mean, everything you can think. I was a, it was a drug. It is a drug. It is. It is a drug. I remember one time before I came into the face, we, we were going to, with my ex-wife and children, to Atlanta, and I had to do that drive by myself. If any of you know Bustelo, 
which is a Puerto Rican coffee, it's like espresso. And I used to take it and make it black, put it into a bottle, and add some sugar to it, and just, if I got tired, mm. sip it. When I got to Atlanta, I couldn't sleep. <laughs> Could yeah. not sleep. It is a drug, and it is dangerous. Very dangerous. Yes, you're, you're, me you're messing with the normal, uh, natural laws of your health. If your body says it's time to go to sleep, and you cannot keep your eyes open, you're supposed to, at that time, go to sleep. You're not supposed to force yourself and manipulate yourself into staying awake. And you know how you know this thing is a drug? You know how you know, besides the physical effects it, it makes? Tell someone not, that they can't have it anymore. That's, to me, that's surefire proof that it's a drug. If I see evidence that clearly states that apples are bad for you, I could give them up. I, w I would miss them. I would miss apple pie. I would miss uh, Granny Smith apples and all the different kinds. There's so many different kinds. But if I found out evidence that proved that apples were beyond the shadow of a doubt, that apples were bad for you, I would be able to give those up. But you see, people aren't able to give this up because there is a perverted relationship that they have with it. Sam, then Madeline. When I left coffee, I went to decaf. And then I started to ask myself a question. How do they make a naturally caffeinated beverage mm. and turn it to decaf? Yeah, How that's do a good do point. It? What process, what chemicals do they put into that bean to make it decaf? And can they completely make it decaf? because I was drinking Bustela decaf and it tasted the same as the caffeinated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Strong. Yeah. You know, so it, I, it's a lie. Yeah. Madeline? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I think the confusion lies where time after time you have either the Food and Drug Administration or um, I don't know, um, privately funded scientists or people who come out and say, oh, this is so good for you. If you drink two to three cups a day, it will sustain you, it's healthy for you, it, it prolongs life. And people are confused because they're not taking the time to study for themselves yeah. to see that, no, this is actually the opposite. Okay, this is detrimental to your health. They're not taking the time to study for themselves. And that's why it's so important for you to present this information. And I pray that a whole lot more people will be able to see it and so that they, their minds can be sparked and so that they can expand or expound on it and say, okay, maybe I should just look a little deeper into this to see how much Absolutely. effect that this will have on my health. Absolutely. And you think about, oh, three cups. What's that, $5 a pop for a coffee if you go to a coffee shop? If you go to Starbucks, it's even more. So once again, you see the money aspect involved in that. Oh, she, you should have three or four cups of coffee a day. And people, you're right, people don't study this out, and they, they need to, because I can tell you just as an ex experiential piece of evidence here, and I'm sure, Samuel, for the amount you were drinking, that you could, you could probably say the same. I did not think the same way when I was, let's say, sober from caffeine than when I was amped up on it. My, my spiritual discernment and everything was all completely different. Paul? This is all well and fine, but this is the problem. He who said thou shalt not kill also laid down the health law. And without a conversion of that part this will never happen. And this is the problem with putting the health message before the gospel. It doesn't work. Who are these people going to believe? Who are they going to believe? You, uh, an uh, a alarm installer, or are they going to believe the 6 o'clock news? Are they going to believe the PhD? You have to have a conversion of the mind first. And coffee and tea is child's play. Mountain Dew. Uh, these drugs, and it's not even so much the caffeine, as bad as that is, the other carcinogens that are in there.
They never talk about them. Always just the caffeine. But without conversion, and this is where you're going with the profit, this is what it's about. You're never going to change anything because it has to be the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So to put this aside from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit does not work. It makes you a kook or a blowhard. That's all it does. Adventists are now saying soda's okay. Coffee and tea is okay. This is coming out of the conference. So where are you going? But then they've pushed the Holy Spirit out of the church, as the independents are doing also, which go to the other side of the ditch. Oh, don't do this, don't do that, don't drink this, don't... Well, without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't work. All right. That's a good point. All these, all these battles, these are very personal battles. And this is just information that is being presented for one to consider. This statement right here, claiming that the problem with many unexplained illnesses is from caffeine. He made this in 1967. What has changed? What has changed? Now we're hearing something different, aren't we? We're hearing something different nowadays. So when you look at Mrs. White and her statements made here in 1863 against meat, today meat is classified as a carcinogen. Prior to, tobacco is a poison. 1950s, finally admitted that tobacco, yes, in fact, is a poison. In the 1960s, illnesses otherwise unexplained may be caused by excessive ingestion of xanthine cocoa alkaloids, including those in coffee, tea, cocoa, and those in some popular beverages. What makes you think this statement's not true also? But again, these are very, these are, these are our, our, our giants, if you will. We all have to face these with God on our own. And Paul's absolutely right. It's, I didn't give up me because of health. Me, personally, I didn't give up meat because of health. I gave up meat because God wanted me to. And I loved him. And I wanted to do his will. And that's why anybody, if they're thinking about coffee and tea or want to study this out further, and the, the truth is there, when you give it up, if you give it up, you do it for Christ. That's why you do it. Madeline has something to add? <laughs> I'm sorry, you just said what I wanted to say. It is a personal conviction, and it's based on your connection with Christ. Amen. You can't force anyone to no. eliminate anything from their diet or to incorporate a plant-based diet. It has to be a personal conviction, and we have to pray for our loved ones who are facing health challenges because of their diet. Yeah, absolutely. Samuel? The problem is that most of our people don't believe the spirit of prophecy. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. You know, my, my Crystal, my daughter, you know, I talked to her about, you know, flesh foods. She says she's not there yet. I understand that. Why are you not yet there yet? I remember when they first visited us on the Christmas holiday that they were here. I gave her a bag full of spirit prophecy books. Hmm. And to this day, she has not taken one out to read it. Wow. So yeah, it, in, in my opinion, if, uh, to go back to what Madeline was saying for a second, the, to, to have the health principles instilled into your life and to not do it through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, to me, is, is the perfect uh, definition of having a form of godliness but denying the power. You're literally denying the power. Um, so yeah, these things, and, and I think Paul is absolutely right. My, my, I didn't really have that much of a problem with coffee and tea as much as I had a problem with energy drinks, which are far worse. They do to the liver. It, it, it's, it's like drinking liquor. You might as well be drinking liquor. And I used to drink liquor with them. So imagine what that did. Paul? And, you know, one other thing, I find it extremely, the timing of the prophet talking about, and biggest example is, when was the health message given to the Adventist people, before or after 1844? 
Now, mind you, the Methodists had it prior to that. They mm. had it 100%. You know that, right? Mm. But it was after 1844 because there had to be a spiritual change first. Then the prophet came. Interesting. There had to get our attention. So all this stuff, without understanding the prophet, you don't understand it, and you're not going to make the change. Nowadays, the veganism is because of animal rights, and that's a whole nother yeah, religion. That's, right. that's a whole nother religion, because animals have more rights now than people. You realize that, right? So that is a counterfeit of the devil. So when did this come about and why? It's the spirituality that needs to be looked at. Perfect timing, Paul. <laughs> So let's, uh, we're in our last 10 minutes. We're going to look at some of the biv bi biblical, <laughs> let me say that right, biblical physical signs. In Daniel chapter 10, verses 8 and verses 16 through 18, it says, Therefore I was left alone. And you could find this, uh, these same elements uh, in other parts of the Bible. Therefore I was left alone, and I saw this great vision. So he, he's going in vision, okay? There remained no strength in me. For my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. So no strength, mentions it twice, he's not using it metaphorically. Uh, he, part of the prophet when they go into vision is they will be strengthless. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips, and then I opened my mouth and spake. Straightway there remained no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. So no breath also. And there came again and touched me one like unto the appearance of a man and he strengthened me. So we have these elements here. You have no strength. You can speak. The prophet can speak, but they have no breath. They are then strengthened and then their eyes remain open the entire time. We can get that from Numbers chapter 24 verse 4. He hath said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. So their eyes remain open. They're not, essentially, they're not doing this. I see this and this. Their eyes are open. They're, they're talking to you. There's no breath coming out of their mouth. And God doesn't have to do it this way. He could have done it that way and just let them, you know, have breath and close their eyes. He could have done it that way, of course. But he did it this way so that we would what? Test the prophets by this criteria. So, with Mrs. White, it says, In her vision, her eyes were open. There was no breath. But there were graceful movement of the shoulders, arms, and hands expressive of what she saw. It was impossible for anyone else to move her hands or arms. When the vision ended, she was then limp and strengthless. Martha Amidon in her note notebook leaflets. That's an eyewitness. We have another one here. On June 28, 1857, I saw Sister Ellen G. White in vision for the first time. I was an unbeliever in the visions. But one circumstance, among others that I might mention, convinced me that her visions were of God. To satisfy my mind as to whether she breathed or not, I first put my hand on her chest sufficiently long to know that there was no more heavings of the lungs than there would have been had she been a corpse. I then put my hand and placed it over her mouth, pinching her nostrils between my thumb and forefinger, so that it was impossible for her to exhale or inhale air, even if she had desired to do so. I held her thus with my hand about 10 minutes, long enough for her to suffocate under ordinary circumstances. She was not in the least affected by this ordeal. Since witnessing this wonderful pheno phenomenon, I have not once been inclined to doubt the divine origin of her visions. That's a statement by D.T. Bordeaux, Battle Creek, Michigan, given February 4th, 1891, and he's recalling 1857. So a non-believer was made a believer out of these visions. These visions, I want to say, these didn't happen in a closet somewhere. Like many times you hear, oh, I've had a vision, and here it is. This is what we got to do like Joseph Smith's, for instance. These happened at camp meetings with thousands, sometimes thousands of people there, at least 50 people in each go. She would hold up a large print Bible on a number of occasions, and she would hold it up for over a half hour. I can't do that. And she would turn the pages to the scripture references that she was making, quoting them perfectly. 
because there was a divine being there. And D.T. Bordeaux was convinced of that. I want to close with this. What about these modern prophets? Do they pass the physical tests? In the presence of a holy God, come on, lift up those holy hands. Amen. How many need to hear from God? Uh, look at your neighbor and say, I just need to hear from God. And tonight, I don't want to hear no mess. I don't want to hear no junk. I refuse to be entertained tell them where I am right now I need God to speak to me now look up and say oh Lord speak to me right now in Jesus name thank God now listen all over the building get your Bibles right quickly and let's go to the Word of God May I be permitted to tell him, Lord? May I please share with him? If it's your permission, I say to you, would you grant it unto me tonight? Because if not, I'll keep it and hold it for another time. Thank you, dear Lord. Behold, even this night I am the Lord thy God. Expressly I have seen the going through and the testing and the trying thereof of your faith. Behold, I am the Lord this night that have heard thy prayer. For there is a ringing from the St. Louis from the heavens, saith the Lord. And I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. And behold, even know this night that I shall be God to deliver. 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 I shall be back I dare to step to my say, God said, deliverance is here now. I just heard the Holy Ghost said, you're not just coming out. God said, you're not just coming out of it. God said, you're already out. Get somebody by the arm and say, come on, let's walk out of here now. Ah, my God, I'm out here, I'm I know this is different, but, uh, you know, I didn't intend to go this way. Told him again with, I had a good sermon. Thoroughly scripture. But the Holy Ghost got a hold of it. Amen. And I learned a long time ago to follow him. Amen. All right, we'll see what we can do here. Okay. <laughs> So what did you guys think about the physical tests and the other tests? How can they be applied to Kenneth Hagin and Prophet Nathan Simmons? Was, and what's sad is there was 
thousands of people in one of that building, at least hundreds in the other. And was that orderly? No. Was Nathan Simmons breathing? Was he closing his eyes and opening? No. He was closing his eyes. He was, he was breathing as normal, right? Not the way the, the physical signs that we were supposed to see. And there was a prosperity gospel there, wasn't there? It was a good feeling. The first one, I think, was just a man um, doing an entertainment show. Absolutely. The one with Kev Kenneth Hagen, I think that was demonic in origin. Because if you watch that whole video, and it's about 30 minutes long, he started up there to, to give a, a sermon, and then he said, the Lord got a hold of him. And notice, him and Nathan both started by opening up their Bibles, not to any chapter, not to learn anything, but they opened their Bibles, and then they started doing their own thing. And then he starts hysterically laughing, and he can't stop. And he starts walking through the crowd. For 30 minutes, this was the sermon. And he's blowing at people, and people are falling down, and all sorts of things. And we call this the movement of the Holy Ghost? No. There's a difference. There's major differences between false prophets and true prophets. None of Mrs. White's visions were like this. People weren't scared of her approaching them. When she spoke, she spoke to their edification, to their encouragement. It wasn't disorderly. There was no screaming. There was no, no murmuring in different, different tongues that somebody, nobody could understand. It was for the edification of the church. And that's the major difference. Next, we're going to look into the prophetic pattern that we see throughout Scripture and see how Mrs. White fits into that. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, once again, we thank you so much, Lord. We thank you so much for your word that it is our safeguard that we can test what individuals are doing out in the world who claim to be such and such, claim to be prophets, apostles, and we can test them and prove whether they are or whether they are not of divine origin based upon the counsel that you've given us in your word, Lord. We thank you for that safeguard. Lord, help us to understand it more, to, to apply more and more things to our lives. And for all the sins that we have, Lord, that anything, Lord, in our lives that is displeasing to you, that you would help us through your strength to remove it. In Jesus' name, amen.